teaching artist Deepti Menon, and I am joined here by art prof teaching artist Alex Rowe and Prof Lou herself. Welcome, everybody. Today, we are going to be talking about our favorite art projects. If you are looking to strengthen and flex your art muscle, Art Prof is the community for you. We have tutorials, critiques, and more, and it's all for free. So I'm going to start off by saying we have phrased this as our favorite art school project, but sometimes our favorite art school projects don't necessarily mean our most successful or the most joy-inducing projects. And Clara, could you elaborate a little bit on what I mean by that? Well, I think in art school, the product is sometimes much less important than the process, the experience, the skills that you take away, because a lot of the projects we're going to show you today, I'm not even sure I own some of them <laughs> anymore. And so you have to say, well, if I don't own the physical product, then why was I doing that project to begin with? And it has to do with something about the process. Because Alex, out of all the projects you did in art school, I mean, how many of them do you really think were successful pieces where you hit it out of the park? <laughs> um, for my time, not many, not many at all. I think I wish uh, me and more college students had the mindset of it's about that learning process. I wanted to make everything to be something that hit it out of the park. And I was very frustrated when all I did was learn for a project. <laughs> so Deepti, we have this first project we're going to talk about, which is a project you did freshman year. And it was a collaborative project. So you were working with two other students. Can you tell us what the project was? Yes, so this is second semester of my freshman year in college. And the project was to create a boat, a life-size boat um, out of cardboard and have it hold at least the weight of one person in the team. And then we went to a lake and rode the lake. So what you're seeing right now is um, a mini scale of the boat, which was step one. And so we made a small scale, kind of wrapped it in plastic and uh, put it in a body of water to see if that would float. And then we went on to making the large scale boat, which hopefully would hold one or all three of our weights. And I worked with two wonderful friends of mine, Katie Aquera and Janice Chun, to make this cardboard boat. And um, I was a freshman and like you said, Alex, it, a lot of it was just process and learning what you like and freshman year is all about that. And the main takeaway for me from this project was that um, I needed to be a better person in a group project. I really noticed that like working 3D was overwhelming for me. And I, there was a lot of moments where I was just standing there and being like, whoa, this is too much for me to handle while my two really amazing group partners were like working away. Um, and my other takeaway was just that I really love working 3D on a small scale, but when things get like this, large scale, I have a heart attack and just cannot deal with it. So it was really eye opening for me because I never worked on something that big. I mean, this boat was like six and a half feet long. Like it was it was really big and made just from cardboard. And I think we used joints. I actually believe that we were allowed to use glue. I can't remember, but there were some difference with like how we could put everything together. Then we shrink wrapped it and um, ended up going to a lake in Rhode Island. And we got all three group members in the boat and we paddled and it was actually really successful. And I'm very, very happy that it happened, but all in all, it taught me a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, have you ever done a collaborative project like this where you were working with other people on one object? No, that is something where I was, remember being really jealous of that project, Deep D, when I was a freshman, because I would see other students working together and crafting their cardboard boat. And it was the kind of thing where I knew I would be terrible at it, but I wanted to give it a shot. Uh, yeah, so all of my experiences like that of learning what I didn't like freshman year, they were all solo projects. So I think that benefit of you also learning that group mentality in it is like hugely important. Did, did, did you guys did you guys kill each other? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. Honestly, I was so aware of how badly I was doing. I was hyper aware of it. Also, I will note that I was in incredibly sick the two weeks that we were working on the full scale. So that oh. added to the stress. But 
they were so nice to me. I honestly just felt like Katie and Janice were so nice to me. And I was like, if this was <laughs> roles reverse, I would be really upset, but we did not It was really pleasant. And honestly, it was such a fun day, but I do feel like at the end of the day, I left that project being like never working this scale again. And also deep you need to be a better group <laughs> project <laughs> worker. But Alex, I know that you work kind of in a solitary way a lot of times with your projects. Do you feel like you've ever had a group project that you succeeded or failed in? Like, what is your experience with group projects? Because I think I've gotten better thanks to this project. Yeah, it's, it's really funny that the mindset of working as a professional illustrator with every project is a group project because the mm. client will have that expectation and you have to kind of be willing to work within their parameters and what their goals are and kind of it's funny to guide them in what you think will objectively work better but might be opposite of their vision and kind of gently suggesting advice rather than kind of steamrolling it we have a comment from Gural. Sorry, I don't know how to say your name. They are saying sometimes it's better to work alone and sometimes teamwork, better teamwork. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's hard because when you have a team to work with, you can do bigger things, things that are much more ambitious. But you have to deal with other people's opinions and it's not always easy. Sometimes working on your own, you don't need to ask anybody for permission to do anything. Mm -hmm. So it's a delicate balance. So here's a project where Alex, you were working on your own. Can you tell us about this piece? Well, this isn't yours. This is a handout. Oh, no. yeah. <laughs> and this is a great way to start it because it was a class taught by a man named Paul Karasik, who's a phenomenal cartoonist and uh, one who studies cartoons as well. And I was excited to take this comics class because I was just sitting here like an idiot thinking, oh, I did comics in high school with my buddies. I'm probably the best at this. So let's take an easy class. <laughs> and when I made comics in high school, it was just you turn the page, you start drawing on something and you call it a day. And I didn't really plan anything and it was the worst. <laughs> And in Paul's class, and I think this handout shows it really well, he taught that you really engineer a comic and you, des you structure it the way you structure a story. And you have that extra challenge and opportunity of making every panel and every page work for you, both visually and with the writing. We have actually a comment here from Raw Nuck about the last project. I'm wondering if you guys also have the kind of group projects where one person does the whole work and the others just exist. Well, we did do a group project when I was in this 3D class and it was, you worked in partners, okay? And I wanted to murder my partner, basically, who actually was my husband. <laughs> he ended up being my husband. He wasn't my husband at the time. So we nearly killed each other. but. I definitely saw there was one partnership where one person did the whole thing and the other person did nothing. So yeah, that can definitely get very, very complicated. And mm -hmm. Tom G is saying teamwork is great, pushes you into new ways of thinking and adjusting to accommodate other people's vision. Yeah, and I have to say Art Prof is like that. We're very much a collaborative team and we don't always agree, but that's a good thing because then we get more ideas on the table. So Alex, what did you end up doing? You have this one page comic, what's going on here? Yeah, so the assignment was we had, I believe one week to make a one page comic conveying how to complete a task, kind of an instructional comic with no words. And again, I was sitting here like, <laughs> I did comic. I know what to do here. And this is the final draft, of course. But in the first several attempts, Paul was really great and like emailed with us throughout the week as we worked on it. And it was just like, no, no, no. What are you doing? No. <laughs> like, and it was a lot of learning how to plan a page, which was something that in my ignorance to the craft, I had never done before. And how to organize every panel within the whole page to tell the most cohesive story you can. In a way, a lot like Deep Tea, what it sounds like building the boat would be like of how to make it structurally sound and float. 
Yeah, yeah, I think that's um, such an interest. Oh, sorry. I was just like, that's such an interesting comparison because a lot of times people see such a difference between 2D work process and 3D work process, but really there is so many overlap and similarities in just the planning and making sure the final project is structurally sound, regardless of if it's what that structure is. <laughs> and I also think, Alex, this was probably an important project because it probably destroyed your ego for a little bit, didn't it? Oh yeah, absolutely. It was one of those projects where it really helped to break me down and build me up again, where I, I can't shout Paul's praise enough where just his knowledge about the comic book art form uh, really inspired me to kind of work to craft them the best way that I could. And it was one of those things where in the final crits, it was really great talk with him of like any error or flaw that I made in them he was very like, you see where this could have been better. It's like, I don't. And then he would help talk me through it. It's like, oh, now I get it. Okay. And when I hit accomplishments in that task, in that class, sorry, like I felt so proud that I had finally overcome it because it was such a challenge to understand. Right. And I think the three of us, we've all been that know-it-all art school students <laughs> where we come into class and we're like, ah, I've done this, I know what I'm doing. And you really do have to learn humility as an artist. What do you think about that, Deep D? Oh my gosh, for real, because like you, so many people come into art school from an environment where they are, they are the best artist or the one that's known of being an artist. And then you go to art school and you're like, this is still gonna be, it or you'll have a specific class where you're like this was my thing i'm going to be so good at it and then you go in and there's like the einstein of whatever that discipline is in that class so i think what you have to learn eventually is that you're never going to be the best person in the class but you're also probably never going to be there's never going to be a worst person in the class because art is so varied and different that there's no such thing as the worst it's just all different Scott is saying paneling and lettering seems so difficult as an aspiring comic book artist because in a lot of ways, while using basic design ideas, they don't have many equivalents. So you either do it or you don't. Well, Alex, what was the hardest thing about the paneling? Because we can see that you definitely experimented with many different types of panels. What do you find challenging about that? I think the... I, this was one of the elements of the class that I didn't find frustratingly difficult, but I found like an exciting thing I almost didn't know you could do. Where again, in high school, all my panels were like, panel has to be a black box. Like it has to do that. And then in Paul's class, like talking about how the different ways of panels can make different moods and different concepts for the piece. I was like, they can do that? Like <laughs> you're allowed? <laughs> like, And so it was really fun. Like you can see in the copy one the first project versus like the images from the final which the final of course was 10 pages in two weeks so it was it, i think a lot less successful than the copy one but it was a lot of fun to like kind of play and kind of take what i learned from the class to experiment rather than to feel like i was making something perfect all right well the next project is mine and this was a project that was notorious at RISD. It was called the Chess Set Project. And so what you had to do was pick an artist or some artistic genre and create a chess set based on those objects or artworks. I don't know what I was thinking. I chose Renaissance tomb sculpture and so I knew cool. nothing about 3D. And so I made all sorts of just idiotic mistakes I said, oh, I'm gonna carve plaster blocks. And I'd never done this before. So I cast these plaster blocks and I'm not joking, I carved these with a chisel and a metal dental tool, which is the dumbest way to make a 3D plaster piece. If I were to do this today, I would make a mold and I would sculpt these out of clay. I'd be done in like two weeks or something. And you know what's really evil about the way the professor assigned this project is he gave it to us the first day of class and said to us, it's due the last day of class and never said anything about it in between. <laughs> he gave us, I think, one afternoon where we were allowed to work on it a little bit, but he didn't give us 
any guidance, no technical support. And it was a lesson in time management because there were some people who came in the last day of class and they had two chess pieces. We were supposed to do 16. And so the time management thing became so obvious who managed their time and who did not. Like, Diti, is time management important when you're an artist? <laughs> oh my God, is that even a question? Of course it is. I remember in my thesis year of RISD, there was a senior critic we had who said that whenever you're working on client-based things to figure out how much time you think it'll take and then multiply that by three. And that's how much time it will actually take. And I live by that. And I think it's so important, like when you're in school or when you're not working on client-based stuff to learn time management, because once you're making money off of the work, like it's one thing, Alex, don't you think when you're in school and to mess up? Yes, it's awful, but there's not like thousands of dollars on the line or your reputation yeah. or burning bridges, right? Yeah, it's a completely different world. And in a lot of ways, it sounds so cold, but Clara, this professor's technique, it's like, that's what school's for. And I admire that kind of like bird pushing the baby bird out of the nest. And it's like, gee, I hope you can fly, bud. <laughs> like, because <yeah, laughs> I remember some professors that were very lax with like, hey, don't forget, don't forget. And it's, that was nowhere near as the preparation for that real world DP that you're painting. Yeah. Mm hmm. I love this comment here from Karen. Sorry, it's not showing up right now. But they're saying, doing something the dumbest way possible is a way to learn about. <laughs> this is absolutely one of those things. And I just did not plan this because I did some work, but I did the bulk of the work, I believe, in the last three weeks, which is really dumb because the semester is 12 and I really should have done a little bit every week. I did not. And I paid for it because I remember over Thanksgiving vacation, I was so behind that I spent my whole Thanksgiving vacation in my parents' basement from eight o'clock to midnight every single day to finish this chapter. <laughs> And because of this, I have never missed a deadline. And so, yeah, it was horrible. And it took me a month for my hands to recover from cramping up so much. But it really taught me a lesson about not waiting until the last minute to get something done. So it was a really, really painful project like your boat, Deep D. But it's really something that I always refer to when I think about time management. By the way, we do have this other stream where Kat and I and Jordan, we talk about our favorite art projects. I always think these are so fun because they stretch you creatively and it's fun to see what are some of the projects that people are doing in school. So Alex, let's talk about this one. We, we always refer to this project as quote, the dude chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and actually Alex did this when he was in my class. I think you were a sophomore at the yes. time? Yes. Yeah, I was I because I remember that was the big thing about this project that made it like my favorite because I walked into RISD thinking like, oh, like I want to do like fun comics and kids books and stuff. And freshman year, just by the luck of the draw, I had very abstract, fine art based professors that really kind of made me question everything that I wanted to do with art. Um and this project, you gave it with such a free form ability, but still with the rigor that your classes have, that it allowed me to explore and kind of, this was the first project after freshman year where I kind of got my like whimsy back and I was able to like kind of have fun and let my sense of humor hopefully come through. And to me, that was where it was the most successful because it was a chance to kind of break out of the mold that art school had put on me and kind of let my own stuff shine. And so we call this the dude chair because it was a chair you owned and apparently you did everything in it from yeah. drawing to choosing ties to putting your dirty laundry on mm -hmm. top. And I, so this personal story that you told was just so much fun and it was so genuine. Like, Deep D, don't you think that sometimes mining from your own life sometimes it's the most mundane stuff that to other people is just so fantastic and strange 
Absolutely. And sometimes also those mundane, hyper specific things can actually be really relatable because, I mean, I don't have a dude chair that I do everything <laughs> in, but it does make me think of places that I really like spending time in and the comical sense behind all of that. So for sure. And I think the more specific and the more like deep you can get into a person's psyche through their art is really, really pleasing, especially when you're in art school too, because these people are your friends and they're your classmates. So you get like a little insight on their on their strange behaviors. <laughs> what yep. are you doing here, Alex? <laughs> that one was based off a true story because the, I found the dude chair on the side of the road and I have I will never stop dumpster diving. I'm merely taking a break during COVID. Um, but I found the chair by the side of the road and it did recline. It did lean back. It was really cool. But there was one morning where I leaned back a little too far and disasters came of it. Wait, did you really spill your cereal? Oh, all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> well, see, I love that because so many people think that an idea for an artwork has to be so philosophical and you have to travel to Indonesia to find it. And for you, it's like a morning accident with your cereal. I just think that's yeah. phenomenal. Well, and that's exactly why this piece, like, and don't get me wrong, I'm still surprisingly happy with how they turned out visually. But yeah, it was that after freshman year, I had the sense that everything had to be so profound and amazing. And it doesn't. Scott is saying, Clara, the thumbnail you just showed reminds me, I remember you said you didn't love the multi-limb paintings you did for your portfolio, my MFA portfolio, but did you at least have fun doing them? I did, and I feel like that's the more important thing is that a lot of these pieces, they maybe don't look that fabulous, but if you have a good experience making them, it really shows. Like. Alice, come on, you had a great time with this project, didn't you? <laughs> so much fun. I miss that chair every day. <laughs> Wait, what happened to the chair? It was actually very beautiful. When I graduated, I left it on the same side of the road that I found it. <laughs> <gasps> oh my God. Sorry. That is the coolest thing. Awesome. Oh, and we have a few more here. What is going on, Alex? <laughs> Uh, there were some Halloween costume props that, yeah, the other thing, the dude chair was such a big series that by the end, I kind of just kind of got loopy and just was making these abstract settings for just different scenarios within the chair. Halloween costume? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> what are you, George Washington? <laughs> like? I was, I was, the, I was a British red coat because I was in the East coast and I thought that the return of the British would be a very frightening thing. <laughs> With bunny slippers, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay. Well, speaking of process, let's take a look, Deep D, at this project you did in your animation class. So what's going yes. on here? So this was a project I actually did in class my junior year of animation. And it was one of the first projects we did right when I started to really dive into being an animator. And what my teacher had us do was we got a ream of paper, which is about 500 sheets. And we were given one hour to animate through the entire 500 sheets and photograph it. And what I love about this is all of us were starting out this animation class really heavy on like details and like animation was a very specific thing to a lot of us. And what this project did was force us because the time restraint one hour sounds like a lot but what happened across the board was we got the 30 minute mark and the 15 minute mark and none of us had even hit a hundred sheets so honestly watching this i think you can kind of see where the panic sets in which is right about there where there's just like a lot of lines <laughs> jumping where i was like oh my gosh i have so much to go and that happened across the board so many of the students right when we heard that we had 20 minutes left saw the amount of pages they had left and all to say is it was this really wonderful moment in the energy of the class. And I wouldn't say that the product is anything super exciting. I think it's fun and it's fun to watch back. But what I learned from it was that like, I still really enjoyed the end product and I love the energy and I love the animation. And that was across the board. All 30 students made work in that one hour that was so stressful for them, but it came out looking awesome. And we learned so much from each other. Like, one student at one point took a knife and just 
cut through the rest of their paper and animated like the differences in that slice uh in the slice like through the paper which was so cool to look at like from an aerial point of view it was like moving around like petals almost and another student spilled ink and allowed it to just drip through and just photographed all that so there was this energy and this honest like creative thinking moment that all of us had to be like okay clocks are ticking and it pre produced this really like variety of animations, but it also taught us that you don't need to spend an hour on each frame, which a lot of us do. And I think it was so informative to me moving forward. And if anyone has seen my work here, a lot of it is really just done in an hour super quick. And I actually wrote about it on the Art Prof website on this blog about like, you know, if you want to read it and get a really deep insight on what this project meant to me, I think it was so informative. But I don't know, I'm curious, Alex, like I know you've animated a little bit before and like, what's your approach to animation? Is it very quick and dirty kind of like this or is it very meticulous? I think that's why I took enough animation to know that I admire it, but would not be good at it at all. Cause I can tell <laughs> you, if I was given those 500 sheets in one hour. I would spend 50 minutes drawing a character on the first page <laughs> and then just have a great British baking show moment of like, wait, what? <laughs> Yeah, that is that kind of looseness and freedom that that seemed to convey. It's just incredible. Yeah, and I do think we about. Have... Go ahead. Sorry, I just think about my animation career and my way of thinking about animation pre this project and post this project because it really rewired my brain. And this project that we're seeing right now is this project named Shell, and it was another project I did in that class where we were given a like state like a, just a shell or like some people were given pencil just an inanimate still object and asked to create motion through it and again prior to the 100 sheets project I probably would have been like okay I'm gonna rotate it and each frame and it's gonna be really like you know specific but then I was like you know what like the movement can come from just the excitement of the marks and experimenting with mark making and it really just redesign my approach to animation and everything I make now is so informed by that and just the possibilities and the excitement and um, rather than focusing too much on the meticulousness and the minuscule. So I think mm -hmm. that project was just so cool and across the board doing it in class was often was like really great because you got to see how it affected everyone, not just yourself. <laughs> we have a comment from Margaret who is saying the lack of time often forces us to be more innovative when we are creatively problem solving. Yeah, that is one thing about art school that I always appreciated was just the quantity of stuff you produce is crazy. And I'll tell you guys, I never want to do that again because it's really stressful to mm -hmm. make that much work under such a short period of time. But what I like about it is you really see the whole process beginning to end. Because Deep D, if they had asked you to do what Alex described, which was draw a character and do it frame by frame and have it take four months, I don't think you would have learned as much about animation, don't you think? No, definitely not. Because I would be focusing way more on the end product, whereas this, the focus was on the process and how to get to that end product. And I was also thinking like it was such a treat that we were able to do it in class. And we actually had our teacher kind of breathing down our neck and keeping tabs on us because if she had given us those 500 sheets of paper and told us to go home, but give us an hour to do it, I can guarantee you there would have been some really different looking animations that came out of it because nobody would have stuck to that. And we would have all been too, our egos would have come in the way. So this was such a good experience of being like, there's no other option to, like Margaret said, be creative and problem solve and stick to the hour that we're given. Raw Nook yeah. is saying, I guess people respond differently to stress. Some just perform better than others. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it really depends on the scenario. And it is also different when you're doing a job because Alex, I'm sure you've had commissions where you said, oh, well, I could do this, but that's just too stressful under the deadline. And sometimes you, you do less than what you could yeah. do. Have you done that before? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, um, it's kind of that difference between the student mindset versus the like, professional mindset where the professional it's at the end of the day, just more realistic where, yeah, deep tea, when you mentioned like that ego that pops up in the art school mindset of like, Oh, I'm the best. I'm going to do some really cool project with this professionally. It's like, you have to kind of look and like, 
okay, this would be very cool, but do I have the time for that? Like, am I going to drive myself crazy doing that? Or is that something I can do in my personal work? Yeah, you have to, in some ways, just pick and choose the situation. Because when you work professionally, like you said, Deep D, with those deadlines, I give myself like a week cushion. If I think it's going to be done on Friday, I say, oh, next Friday is the real deadline. <laughs> because you just never know exactly what could happen with any of those scenarios. All right, this is a project that I did, again, freshman year. What was I thinking, guys? Like, I spent so much time with plaster. It was ridiculous. Thank goodness this one was second semester, so it was not at the same time as the chess set. And granted, I was better at carving plaster. But basically, what we were given was we had to cast, I think, six plaster blocks. And then we had to carve something. And so every single carving that we did had to have a certain parameter. So I think this one is that the form had to be, is it convex or concave? I always get them <laughs> mixed up. It couldn't have any concavities. I think like no <laughs> It had to <laughs> be an egg. <laughs> so I made an egg and then they gave us these other parameters as well. And so this one, if I remember correctly, was based on tongues. Like, do you guys see the shape in the middle? That's sort of like a two-sided tongue. And the so tongue. I was like, oh, what if I wrap the tongues around and it's like interacting tongues? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but so what I really got from this was not just an exercise in craftsmanship because blaster looks terrible if you do a really bad job, but also that the form wasn't just some random thing, that the form actually had a sense of order and structure to it. And this one was actually based on a gourd that I had been observing the structure of. Of course, my friends were like, Clara, it looks like a turkey. I'm like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, so didn't. upset when they That said second that. one definitely does. <laughs> yeah, I, I will admit it's very turkey-like. And so I ended up making two turkeys that were on top <laughs> of this blobby stand thing. And you know what's funny? I still own this project. It's like sitting Aww. on my mantle. It's, it's really weird. I don't know. So I guess for me, long term, the importance of this project is that I didn't do 3D again for three years because I went into illustrations doing all this painting and stuff like that. But then I did get my master's in sculpture. And I really think it was because of this project. Deep Deep, have you seen that where something just comes back after being gone for a long time? Oh yeah, when you have a moment to breathe, and I think especially in art school, sometimes it's hard to find those moments to breathe because you're so laser focused. Like you said, you're in a major and you're focusing on that, but then you come out of school and you revisit these projects you made. Even my process of digging through old projects for this stream was really insightful because I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot I did that. And I really enjoyed doing that. Maybe I should try doing that again. So we do produce so much work, but sometimes you just need to pause and focus on something. And then in the future, it'll come back up. So that's why I'm always telling people experiment, try things, because you never know in the future when it'll pop back up and totally change your course, like for you, Clara, and get you an MFA. <laughs> exactly. And I never thought that would ever be the case. I, uh, we have a comment here from Seven Angelic. Did you ever have such a brief time to spend on something that you felt like you missed learning something or did it all jam pack in there? Alex, why don't you take this one? Yeah, I feel like for me, it was those projects where I wanted to make a beautiful final product rather than to focus on the process. And I focused on the wrong thing, almost like... Uh, to use a comic example, like focusing entirely on one panel rather than the whole page. Uh, yeah, Deep D, do you have an experience like that where you felt like the stress didn't promote learning, but it kind of trapped it? Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with time management where like I'm so overwhelmed and then I realize I have a day to do something. So I really cut a lot of corners and that doesn't help with you know, learning because you should kind of work large and then condense. Whereas what I was doing was just working as small to like get things done. And a lot of times I do also feel like in client based work, sometimes that happens where like the deadline is so around the corner and I would love to try something different or really give them a new inventive way of thinking about things and really use my skills. But the deadline is so quick that I just have to give them something. And it's not always a learning experience, but it meets the deadline. 
Guys, we have an Art Prof Share today. Art Prof Share is where one of you makes something in response to one of our videos, which we love. It just makes us feel so good. So we have an Art Prof Share today from Jose Cuerto. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. And so this is a drawing that Jose did, which was actually one of my draw alongs where we were drawing with white drawing materials on black paper, which is weird, like it totally screws the people. Alex, have you ever done this before, this reversal where you're drawing with white on a black surface? Yeah, I love it. And like the first time I did it, it was just like, does not compute. It was, it felt <laughs> so strange. Yeah, so Jose is saying in their statement, first time following along with one of our demos, and they typically don't do loose and quick portraits, which is why they think their proportions are way off, especially the three quarters view. They said that the demo taught them to be looser, freer when drawing, because a lot of times they tense up. If I make a mistake, just erase it, draw over it. That's really helpful and comforting to know. And they also like the tip of not focusing so much on the facial features so much as the structure of the face. So we have this portrait that Jose did but we also have this portrait as well. And by the way, these are both based on Robert Maplethorpe photos, which we were all drawing from. So Deepti, how do you think Jose did in the draw along? I think you did a really great job, Jose, especially from your statement saying that you're not used to working in this loose manner. I really love the energy of your stroke. And you can clearly see that you're focusing a lot on the structure. And I've actually never worked white, uh, material on a black paper and it sounds really scary but i think you've done a really good job and it's actually making me think like oh maybe i could try it so i, I want to applaud you i think you're doing a really great job and i would love to see more alex what are your thoughts yeah i would echo that i think it's your attention to the structure rather than now i'm drawing an eye now i'm drawing the nose it comes off so clearly especially in this one and i love how your hand kind of has a very stylistic graphic approach to it it really has a cool look that works really well with the white on the black paper, uh, especially in this one too, just very, the contrast is really stellar that you bring out. I have to say, Jose, the figure on the left, awesome zygomatic arch, which is the cheekbone, by the way, if you guys don't know what I'm talking about. But do you see, it's like, there's so little fuss going on in that area. Like, it just looks like it just appeared. And so that's what I really love about when drawings make something that's hard to do look effortless. It doesn't seem like it's an area you struggled with. And so I think that loosening up that Jose is mentioning, I mean, it really, I think, helps so much with the drawing. So really nice work on that. We have a comment here from Blue Will Spirit. They're saying, I remember how hard the technique was. Jose did really good with it. Very cool. So if you guys decide that you would like to have a shout out here on one of our YouTube videos, just go to rprof.org, click on tutorials, and we have a purple button where you guys can go to a submission form and upload your art prof share so we can consider it for a YouTube shout out. Or if you wanna just tag us on Instagram and use hashtag art prof share, we love it when you guys do that. We will share it in our Instagram stories and it's just so much fun for other people to see the work that everyone in the Art Prof family is making. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And please join us in the Discord. Deep D and Alex and I will be hanging out in the post live streams channel. The invite link is in the video description below. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can join the Art Prof family. And thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters. Thank you to everybody for coming to the stream, for contributing your comments. Everybody, thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. How come the thing won't click? Here we go. <laughs> come on. <laughs>